Um, right, so in our reading today, Jesus asks the people a question. Do you want the living bread and the living water? And if you just put it into the context of the people he was speaking to, they were subsistence farmers living in the desert. So getting their next meal and getting water was quite important to them. And so if someone comes to you, and if we put it into the context of where we are today, and says to you, if I gave you a free house in Godalming, all utilities paid for, rent-free, mortgage-free, repair-free, everything is done for you, would you take up the offer? And I'll give you 2,000 a month in your bank as well. Would you take up the offer? Everybody's going to do it, right? Because, I mean, that's the reason we get up at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock whenever to go to work, because that is our biggest fear in life, is that we are not going to have enough food or water to live on and we're going to die. So, therefore, working is the way we actually put a buffer between that. But then Jesus puts a bit of cold water on on the... there's uh, enthusiasm for getting this free gift by saying, well, actually, I'm not talking about the material stuff. I'm talking about the spiritual stuff. And at that point, you probably lose half the audience. (laughs) Because people say, yeah, no, 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 I love the, the spiritual stuff, but actually the material stuff is really important to me. And that's why often people say that religion is for the wealthy because the poor are spending too much time just trying to make ends meet, keep their head above water, that they don't have time for the spiritual stuff. And it's such a big grind in their life just to get through. So if we, if we go down the route and we say, okay, so, so we'll assume that you guys are in the half that stayed, what does the spiritual side of getting the living bread and the living water look like? And what it looks like is Jesus goes on to tell us that what we need to do is we need to eat his body and drink his blood. Okay, now you can imagine if you were there, I mean, we're lucky we've got hindsight. We, we sort of like know what he meant by that. But if you were there, that's quite gross. And I mean, a lot of people find it actually, to use the current term, quite gross. Or they don't actually think they need it in their life. Because what does it actually mean? And most people would go to that reading, something similar to Ephesians that we read, to say, this is what eating Jesus looks like. I take the Ten Commandments into my life, and I say, okay, I am now going to live the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to do exactly what Paul says. I'm not going to get angry. You know, I'm going to suppress my anger. Maybe I'm a normally angry person, and I'm going to be calm, and I'm not going to say the things I want to say. I'll curb it. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to steal. And basically, I'm just living this Ten Commandment life. But you get a lot of people in the world who will say, well, actually, I already do that. I don't need God in my life to do that because I'm a naturally good people. I mean, I don't know how many bad people you know go around killing people. The unfortunate thing is that Jesus said, actually, you can't measure your success in keeping the Ten Commandments by your standards. You actually need to measure it by God's standards. And God's standards is a bit different, as he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells us that even if you think a bad thought, it's as equivalent as if you did it. And that puts a whole new, I suppose, emphasis on this because it's much more difficult to live up to those standards. And that's often why people just say, well, you know, if you can't reach it, you can't reach it. Uh, You know, 
why, why bother trying if you can never get to the end goal? But Jesus does love a trier, and so does God. And so people say, look, as long as God is seeing that I'm actually trying my best, I'm an angry person, but I suppress it, and I'm doing my best to be a better person, God will be impressed, and that will be enough to get me on God's right side. Unfortunately, Jesus said something else. He said, the truth will set you free. And so what did he mean when he said, the truth will set you free? The best way I can illustrate this is by just having a look at a few examples from the Bible. And the first one I want to look at is Jacob and Esau. Do you know the story? It's a famous Old Testament story. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, uh, Jacob and Esau are the sons of Isaac. Isaac is the son of Abraham, who God said he would have this great nation of people come out of his line, and he was going to bless him. So being in that line meant you were exceptionally blessed and close to God. And so being a son of Isaac was very important, but what was more important was being the first son, because under Jewish law, the first son got a double blessing. So that's why we read in the Bible that while Esau and Jacob were in the womb, they were actually already fighting who's coming out first. Uh, Esau was a lot stronger, so he came out first, and the story goes that when they pulled Esau out, Jacob was holding on to his leg, trying to pull him back in. So Jacob was really keen to, to get this blessing. And it ends up that if you read the story, Esau ends up to be a very powerful person. He's a great hunter, but he runs on impulse. He does whatever he wants. He marries whoever he wants to. He has little faith, and we find that out if you look in Hebrews. Hebrews says he was a man of little faith because he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. Okay? So, it's, Jacob, on the other hand, did everything right. He married the right girls, a, a Jewish girl. He, he had God in him. Anyhow, so, the story goes that Jacob did test Esau to see if he would sell his birthright. And he had come back from hunting, and he was very hungry, and Jacob was making the stew. It doesn't sound like a great family life if you, if you look back at this, but anyhow. And the brother says, look, could I have some of the stew? And he says, no, you can't unless you give me your birthright. At which point he says, oh, I'll well, take it. It doesn't mean that much to me. Anyhow, I'll have the stew. I'm hungry. I need to eat. And you don't hear anything else until one day um, Rebecca, who is their mother, overhears Isaac saying to Esau, go and do some hunting, Bring, make me a stew because I'm about to die and I want to give you the blessing. And as a result, he goes out hunting Rebecca says to Jacob, listen, you've got to move, you've got to move quickly if you're going to get this birthright. Uh, and he's a, he's a little apprehensive, but, you know, moms can be persuading. So she says to him, look, I'll make the stew. But he's saying, well, you know, Dad, he's blind, but he'll know it's not me. No, we're going to dress you in Esau's clothing. Uh, and he said, well, Esau's quite hairy, don't worry, we'll put a skin on your hand, yeah, so when the father feels, everything is great. And Jacob walks in, and uh, Isaac says to him, who is it? And he says, it's me, it's Esau, I'm your son, I'm here for your blessing. And, and uh, Isaac says to him, oh, you don't sound like Esau, you sound more like Jacob, but you do smell like Esau. Let me feel your arm. And he feels him and he asks him again, who are you? And he says, no, I'm Esau. So he blatantly lies to his father to get the birthright. 
But here's the interesting thing in this story and while I'm telling it, because God knew about it. God condoned this action. And surely that is a problem for people who want to keep the rules because God is sitting there saying, actually, I'm allowing you to lie to your father so I can give you the blessing which should have been your brother's. Even though he did have the right because the brother had given it to him, but that's besides the point, he did actually lie to his father. And then if we, go, if we go to Jesus in the Bible, we see Jesus goes to the temple, and there are a whole lot of people uh, selling goods and trying to make money out of people coming to the temple. Jesus gets really angry and overturns tables, and uh, they call it a righteous anger falls over him. Now, clearly, if he was reading Paul's letter, that would be behavior that was unbecoming of a Christian person to do that. The other thing that Jesus does, and he doesn't do it once, he probably does it probably 20 times, is he really upsets the Pharisees by healing people on the Sabbath. And they find it offensive because the Sabbath is a time of rest. You should not do what you normally do on, on, on the Sabbath, and Jesus normally heals, so they're saying, well, mm, you shouldn't be doing it on the Sabbath. That's disrespecting God. And Jesus is pains to tell them that actually what he's doing is he's bringing people to God, and surely that's what you do on a Sunday or on the Sabbath. So what this whole thing is telling us is and this is what Jesus said, it's not all about the rules, it's about your love for God. And that prompts the question, are you prepared to break the rules for God? So, if you're watching the TV tonight, and you see all these refugees that are landing on, on, on the beach, and you say, well, I just don't like the way that the government is actually treating those people. I think they could do a lot better because, after all, these are people in God's family, and I think they should be treated in a better way. And you decide, I think a good thing for us to do would be to go and protest outside 10 Downing Street. But the government has put a ban on protesting because this will go with the current COVID-19, uh, are you prepared to break the law and go and protest to help those people? And that may be quite an extreme example because, but, uh, sorry, if you do it, it could impact on your material world because for myself, I'm a qualified accountant, if I was arrested and charged, I wouldn't be able to practice as a qualified accountant anymore, so I'd lose my livelihood. Am I prepared to go that far for God and for people that are just in God's family? And that's really what Jesus was saying when he said the truth will set you free, is how far are you prepared to go for God? What are you prepared to give up? How, how important is the material world to you, that first choice you made? Are you saying, well, actually, it's important, I'll never put it in jeopardy, even to help somebody else? Or are you saying, well, no, God is more important than anything else, any friendship, any material thing, and that's what I want to do? And that is the truth that we all need to try and find, is because if, we, if there are barriers that are preventing us from actually doing stuff for God. We need to work with God to overcome those barriers. And I mean, the last thing God wants is to see you homeless on the street. But he also doesn't want to see his other children just being neglected because I'm too scared to go and do stuff for him because I might lose my comfortable life. And you know, as, I, as I've been saying for, uh, in the last couple of services, you know, they, they tell us that Christianity is an easy thing, but it's not. It's a very difficult thing, and it's a lot of choices, and 
making the choices is difficult and everyone's circumstances difficult are different. But with God's help and with the Holy Spirit, you can actually overcome a lot. And just lay these things in front of God and say, I'm worried about this area of my life. Won't you come in and help me? And he'll do that for you. Why don't we just take a minute and think about that and then I'll, I'll bless the offering.